Thank you everyone for braving the cold uh, and coming out to this event tonight. Uh, we are seeing some folks who've been out at our other events. We see some new faces. Uh, thank you everyone and thank you of course uh, the speakers I'm going to introduce just in just a second. After I tell you about this speaker series, about a couple of other events, um, and a little bit about all the generous funding and support we've had in putting this speaker series together. So my name is Jean Paulo. I uh, direct something called the Urban Democracy Lab, which is an initiative out of the Gallatin School, which is a small interdisciplinary college here within NYU. Uh, the Urban Democracy Lab promotes uh, dialogue on just and sustainable cities, and we're especially interested in promoting spaces that are hybrid of academic activist practitioner. Uh, in their uh, mode of engagement. Uh, we received some help tonight from the Institute for Public Knowledge, which is uh, where we are. We've also received support from Teatro Mundi, another interesting initiative here at NYU. Um, and uh, so the, the series, so this is the first of a few different events. Rosalind is actually the conceiver of this series, uh, who won't be here for the remaining events because of some pressing, but understandable reasons. Um, <laughs> so, so this is Infrastructures of Labor. So this is a series where we're going to explore how, how excuse me, the broader series is the politics of infrastructure, the political infrastructure series. If you haven't signed up for our events or if you want more background on this series, please look us up. We're urbandemos.nyu.edu. So the political infrastructure series is going to explore infrastructure, how the technical elements seemingly technical elements of our infrastructure uh, are political. So this includes housing, architecture, public services such as water, waste and electricity, transportation and data systems. These are key sites of conflict and contest between government and urban dwellers. There are key performative elements of governing as well as sites of claim making, so they have this dual characteristic. Urban infrastructures therefore crystallize patterns of uneven development and injustice. They highlight the city's vulnerabilities and their sites for looking where political dissent. So in this series, we're going to take a critical approach to understanding the politics of infrastructure. And we're going to think through together the different ways that urban infrastructure is implicated in citizenship struggles, urban labor questions, planning practice, and resilience strategies for uncertain urban futures. So we're going to bring out some, some key people thinking on these questions and who highlight different urban possibilities in the global south and global north. Today's panel is the infrastructures of labor and we're going to explore how infrastructures are not just technical artifacts, but are composed of human labor. So from network infrastructures in the global north to do-it-yourself people's infrastructure systems in the global south, the panelists tonight will present research considering how human bodies and communities are interwoven with the built environment in its technical systems. This exploration illuminates how the forms of dirty labor and exploitation that infrastructures depend on the formal systems through which people make their cities conform to them in unpredictable ways and the ways that insurgent politics may arise from rebelling through infrastructure itself. So this is the first of uh, three political infrastructure series event. We're going to have one on a kind of critical sustainability discussion in the spring. Then there's going to be one on insurgent infrastructure specifically. Uh, and we're tying these to two other events that we're having uh, in the spring. Uh, Francis Moore Lapay. Uh, who's written uh, this famous book on uh, Diet for a Small Planet and Quickening of America and many other books. Uh, we'll be talking about food justice and food as infrastructure. Uh, and then Raquel Rolnick, who is a very well-known radical urban planner from Brazil, will be here in the spring also uh, talking through some of these issues. So anyways, uh, if you are not on our email list, uh, please sign up and we'll keep you updated on those dates and times. So tonight, uh, we have Cassie Fennell. Fen or Fennell? Which one is better? My parents fight about it, so it's <laughs> <laughs> weird. Um, Fennell. <laughs> Last name can be a site of contestation and governing as well. <laughs> we'll leave it to the subaltern to define it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're very lucky she's come down from Columbia University. Her work examines the social material legacies of American Fordism and how they shape the politics of racial inequality, collective obligation, and utopian imagination in the urban U.S. with a focus on the urban Midwest. 
Her book manuscript, which has one of the best titles I've heard in a long time, Last Project Standing, Civics and Sympathy in Post-Well for Chicago, takes up these themes through a study of Chicago's ambitious public housing reforms. So thank you, Cassie. Next to Cassie is my colleague here at NYU, Rosalind Fredericks. She's an urban geographer and assistant professor here. Her research and teaching interests are centered in the political economy of development, global urbanism, and post-colonial identities in Africa. Her research is focused on the urban politics and social movements in contemporary Dakar, Senegal specifically, and she's worked uh, on labor and youth movements, focusing specifically on municipal garbage infrastructure and recently the politics of hip hop. Uh, she has edited a recent, a couple of recent books. One of them is The Arts of Citizenship in African Cities, The Infrastructures and Spaces of Belonging, out with Palgrave in 2014. And her manuscript also has a very nice title. It's called Trash Matters, Infrastructures and the Arts of Citizenship in Dakar, Senegal. Uh, next to her is my other good friend, Penny Lewis. She's the Academic Director of Labor Studies and Associate Professor of the Murphy Institute for Work Education and Labor Studies here at CUNY. She writes about class and social movements and is currently working on a book about organizing in cities. She's the, in the leadership of the Professional Staff Congress, the Union of Faculty and Staff at CUNY. And what is the name of the book that you're working on with uh, Miriam? Miriam, uh, the factory, the city is the factory. The city is the factory. So, Malini Ranganathan, let's see how your book title stacks up. She's assistant professor at American University, and she's a faculty fellow at the Metropolitan Policy Center. She's a geographer with a special interest in post-colonial urbanism, and the city of Bangalore has been uh, the focus of her work. She works at the intersection of urban political economy, critical urban studies, and the political economy of development. And her work interrogates how neoliberal infrastructure reforms touch down, quote unquote, in the everyday lives of informal urban dwellers. We don't have a title for your forthcoming book. Apologies. Do you have anything? <laughs> I actually am working on an article track right now. Okay. You have to give us a good title before the end of the... And next to her is another friend of ours, Kafui Atto. He's assistant professor of urban studies also at the Murphy Institute. His BA is from McAllister College and his PhD is in geography from Syracuse University. His broad interests are in the political economy of cities, the politics of public space, and debates in and around the idea of the right to the city. More narrowly, Kafui's research has focused on three areas urban transit role within the political economy of cities, the struggles and livelihoods of transportationally disadvantaged, and the role of urban social movements, including the labor movement in shaping mass transit. Again, we do not have a, a good book title for you, <laughs> but he has written very many interesting articles with good titles. Okay, so, Penny? Um, well, thanks for every, everybody for coming. I am the moderator this evening. Um, and I think that the order of presentations is moving from CAFWI this way. Um, each uh, panelist is going to be speaking for about 15 minutes, and then I'll say a few words, and then we will open it up to all of you. OK, uh, I'll just uh, get to it. Um, uh, a little over uh, two months ago, uh, New Labor Forum published an essay on the issue of climate change uh, and the rather fraught relationship between the labor movement and the environmental movement. Uh, in the essay, the authors argue what are really two things. The first is that uh, unions need to get uh, more involved in the fight against climate change. And the second thing, uh, which was related, is that unions can do this precisely by developing a climate protection strategy of their own. Of course, the question was, and still is, uh, what should that strategy entail? For the authors, the answer was clear, infrastructure, what we're talking about today. Green infrastructure, and more clearly, infrastructure produced on the scale and at the scope of World War II. Winning the climate change fight, as the argument went, uh, will require World War II levels of state investment in everything from uh, new climate-safe buildings, uh, to new sustainable transit systems, to new ways of producing energy. Infrastructure is the answer. Uh, instead of the tanks in this image, imagine wind turbines or solar cells. The argument for labor was thus uh, all but straightforward. The sooner labor can push for new investments in green infrastructure, the sooner unions can put their members to work on the very projects central to saving the planet. So I read this article, uh, which I thought was really good and compelling, uh, after spending two weeks in Oakland, California, talking to transit workers at AC Transit, which is the main system there. Many of the workers I talked to were deeply interested in the issue of climate change and uh, climate change mitigation. And yet, for many, any discussion of green infrastructure or new investments would have 
in many ways not only seem premature, but really secondary to a set of uh, broader concerns over the labor process itself and control over the labor process. And so that is kind of going to be my point, <laughs> and I'll try to develop it over this um, case. So uh, I say all this to set up the following scene. Um, on June 26, 2013, uh, in the city of Oakland, a transit operator from AC Transit named Titus Warren uh, stood up during the public comments period of the board meeting and gave the following performance. And I'll try to find it on, set it up. I am the C220 ATU 192. I don't need to use the restroom. I don't have marital. <laughs> I am the ATU 192 Automaton. I represent the next generation of your children and grandchildren that will provide the technology that will drive all the medium systems of the world. I do not need vacation time. I do not need restroom time. I do not need to argue. Immediate policies and contracts are not necessary because I do not negotiate. Automatic fair invasion and termination to all people who do not pay fares will be dealt with. Thank you very much. But for now, I represent one point two million. Where was I? <laughs> So the performance is uh, is clear. Um, I'm the a uh, C220 AT 192. I don't need to use the restroom. I don't have marital problems. I'm not under stress. I do not get angry. I am the AT 192 automaton. Blah 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 blah. You heard it. So, what do we make of this? What prompted it? Of course, the context here is really important. In June 2013, when this was recorded, uh, transit workers were in the middle of negotiating a new contract. The sticking points uh, were familiar ones. Workers were demanding a 10% hike in wages. Management was offering 9%. Management wanted workers to contribute 10% to their medical premium, premiums. Uh, workers said that was too much. The most interesting element of these particular negotiations, however, was the pro uh, prominence of yet another uh, set of issues. Uh, these were, uh, as the poem alludes to, bathroom breaks, rest periods, and what many workers had come to deem an industrial speed up. In a widely publicized editorial, the president of the union at the time, Yvonne Williams, uh, put it plainly, the district was refusing to provide hygienic restrooms and budget cuts were increasingly translating to a work speed up, quote unquote. Of course, apart from the bathroom issue, uh, this raised an interesting question. What, if anything, does a speed up look like in public transit? A speed up on the assembly line makes sense, right? But what about in transit? Three years ago, I got an answer from a driver named Anthony Rogers, who at the time uh, was the political coordinator for the ATU 182. Anthony uh, started by making a crucial distinction, the distinction be between what transit workers call spot time and recovery time. Drivers are contractually entitled to a 50 minute lunch break for every eight hours of work. That 50 minutes often comes in the form of what drivers call spot time. Per the, lang uh, per the language of the contract, spot time is the time that a driver has at the end of each run to stretch their legs, uh, go to the bathroom, uh, get a bite to eat. But the amount of spot time depends on the length of the run. So for runs between 30 and 60 minutes, drivers are allowed a minimum of six minutes of spot time. For runs shorter than 30 minutes, drivers are given a maximum of five minutes of spot time. For runs over an hour, drivers are given a spot time of 12 minutes. Uh, that's spot time, and it's really important for drivers' uh, general well-being. Recovery time, the other time you mentioned, uh, is the time that is built into the schedule to make sure that drivers can start their next run on time. That is to say, it's built in as a buffer against traffic or unforeseen delays on the road, like if you have to pick up with someone, uh, with someone in a wheelchair or someone is asking you for directions. Uh, for Rogers, the problem at AC Transit and at the heart of the speed-up issue is that recovery time 
uh, is that increasingly management has taken to blurring the distinction between spot time and recovery time. With less money and thus tighter schedules, management was allowed was um, was allowing recovery time really to devour spot time. For drivers, uh, the consequences, of course, uh, have been clear. Um, and here's a little graph I drew up <laughs> to kind of demonstrate that. Uh, this anecdote from uh, Anthony Rogers, again, is uh, indicative. In this last sign-up, I was doing an 18 line. It gave me, leaving from 14th and Broadway to 40th and Martin Luther King, I had six minutes. Six minutes from 14th and Broadway to the MacArthur BART station at 40th and MLK. A NASCAR driver couldn't do that. Let me take that back. You can do it in six minutes if, the tra if traffic is clear, if you don't catch any lights, and if you don't waste your time picking up passengers. <laughs> now, let's say you're 10 minutes late when you get to the end of the line, and you have 15 minutes of spot time. That means you only have five minutes uh, when you get there, and the only restroom you know uh, is at Marin and San Paolo in the nearest Albany City Hall, which is a block away. So you have five minutes to get off the bus, run over to the restroom, do what it is that you have to do, and run back. For Rogers, the bathroom issue and the speed up issue uh, were one and the same. To paraphrase a line from David Gartman's study of the auto industry, cuts in transit funding uh, were essentially subordinating the natural rhythms of the human body and mind to the demands of management. But of course, the consequences of what he was describing went beyond the level of inconvenience. Uh, this past summer, the ATU saw the publication of this, a report uh, by two interns at AC Transit uh, named Elena Kessler and Michelle Gon Gonzalez, who are really great, uh, funded by the Occupational Health Inter uh, Internship Program. The report made explicit the link between bathroom access and the health of bus drivers at AC Transit, who, like many drivers, suffer higher rates of urinary tract infections and renal damage. Drawing on a survey of 98 operators, Kessler and Gonzalez not only um, looked at how drivers at EC Transit coped or did not cope with inaccessible bathrooms, but they looked at the reasons bathrooms uh, were inaccessible. The report ends with a number of recommendations. Uh, these include um, investing in um, operator-only restrooms, um, allowing AC Transit drivers to use employee bathrooms at BART stations, introducing restroom inspections at key stops, and improving uh, OSHA regulations uh, for mobile workers, which occupy a separate category under OSHA law, mobile workers, that is. Of course, for many drivers, the most effective solution uh, has long been apparent and that is simply to allow more spot time and more recovery time at the end of each run. The solution would in some be to slow down the work. Bathroom inspections, designated bathrooms like this one, infrastructure, or more sanitary facilities would of course be great. But such improvements only make sense if drivers have the time at the end of their run to actually get to the bathroom. Given this context, the Titus Warren performance suddenly begins to make a lot of sense, if anything. It hits precisely on the issues of bathroom breaks, speed ups, uh, working conditions that were really live um, at, uh, the, uh, at the time. Uh, of course, if you ask Warren himself, which I did, uh, you, get the same, you get the same response. Two months ago, I contacted Warren uh, via Facebook and asked him about his performance, uh, kind of out of the blue. Uh, this is what he said, the name of the performance uh, which is not mentioned is the dehumanization of human labor for the sake of private corporations to control production. The less I value you and give you consideration of being human, you will subside humanism and take on the mannerisms of a machine. It actually gets kind of weird toward the end, but it's very, uh, pro very profound. <laughs> um, in their famous book, uh, Void Where Prohibited, Mark Linder and Ingrid Nygaard make an important observation. Rest period legislation has almost always been enacted uh, in instances when capital has accepted the fact that human beings are subject to different physical laws than machines. Capital, they argue, has in these instances understood that rest periods can contribute to productivity and to the health of their workers. Uh, Linder and Nygaard do not, however, mention the alternative. Uh, in other instances, capital's approach to the unbearable humanness of its workforce is not to offer rest breaks, but to substitute living labor with, uh, with infrastructure and what Marx called dead labor. Give, that's kind of the title. <laughs> uh, now it makes sense. <laughs> uh, where does this leave us? So I started this talk uh, with an article from New Labor Forum that argued for placing infrastructure investment at the heart of uh, Green Blue Alliance Against Climate Change. These investments, the article went on, should be at the scale and at the scope of World War II. 
Of course, the entire purpose of what I've just said has been to argue that for labor, infrastructure investments uh, only matter to the degree that they allow workers to shape the labor process in more just ways. Will infrastructure investments come with more spot time or recovery time? Will they allow drivers enough time to urinate? P. <laughs> Will they instead come with a speed up or a slowdown? Will they relieve the need for human drivers altogether? Will infrastructure come in the form of a C220? These, of course, are not idle questions, especially if we take seriously the World War II analogy. Um, after all, the very thing that defined uh, uh, the economic mobilization behind World War II, uh, namely a speed up in industrial production, is precisely what AC transit workers have long been complaining about. So in, that, in the same way that building a new portable bathroom at the end of a transit route uh, only matters if workers have time to use it, debates over infrastructure must include a discussion of the labor process itself, if anything, for the sake of laboring people. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to bring my work on the political ecology of flooding, flood risk, and storm drainage infrastructure into conversation with this panel on infrastructures of labor. I'm going to tell you a story today about why the city of Bangalore, officially Bengaluru, in southern India, is increasingly prone to flooding. And this is a story that really resonates with a great many cities around the world. Um, developing Asia is one of the areas in the world that is at most at risk from climate change induced flooding. And so it's a good case to think with. I've been doing ethnographic field work here for the last two years, trying to understand the historic reasons behind the production of flood risk. So I'm going to try and tell you that story through a historicization of the labor involved in producing a humble and often neglected artifact, stormwater drains. Now, stormwater drains are really neglected in the scholarly, liter the scholarly literature as well, because as you, you know, hear from the list that was read out, you know, there's water, uh, research on water, on electricity, on sanitation, but very little research actually on stormwater drains. It's kind of a generic name for a range of infrastructures, right, including pipes, ditches, canals, um, rooftop spouts, open drains, combined sewer systems, storm flow systems um, that, you, that you see very much so in the case of Euro-American cities. And they're intended fundamentally to help protect human settlements from the onslaught of rain. So I've been considering these artifacts very seriously, and my overarching argument is that we have to look at these storm drainage infrastructures um, as assemblages, okay, as socio-natural assemblages. They've been enrolled through human labor into these different assemblages over time, but that these assemblages also wield a more than human agency in the production of flood risk. So while they have been made by human labor, in turn, they exert a kind of agency that we have to really be cautious of and try to understand going forward, thinking about climate change risks and thinking about extreme weather events. As we will see here in the story I'm going to tell you today, the changing assemblage relationships that storm drains have had in this developing city with the colonial state and then the post-colonial state with sewage, with waste, and with capital accumulation all matter in the production of flood risk. And so I'm really going to talk about how materiality matters here, how it has a particular agency. Now, why the city of Bangalore and why flood risk? Well, at first glance, Bangalore is a city of 8 million people, similar to New York. It seems an unlikely place to study flooding, right? Unlike coastal cities like Mumbai or Dhaka in, 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 in uh, developing Asia, Bangalore actually sits 3,000 feet above sea level in the rain shadow of the Deccan Plateau. And it does, not extreme ex it does not experience extreme rainfall like some of the other coastal cities do. Yet, in 2005, Bangalore experienced one of the worst floods in recent memory, um, three months after rain wreaked havoc on Mumbai. Now, if you remember 2005, it was a particularly bad year around the world, um, with Hurricane Katrina also um, happening in New Orleans that year, and severe floods throughout developing Asia. Although mortality was many times lower in Bangalore than in Mumbai, 
over half of the city and its major roads, um, especially at the, at the outskirts, the peri-urban outskirts, were inundated. Thousands of homes and commercial establishments suffered flood damage. Colleges and schools were shut. Hospitals reported alarmingly high numbers of waterborne diseases. So these pictures were taken by an, a friend of mine in 2005. I actually wasn't there, but uh, an urban of, a planner, a friend of mine, um, who took these pictures in the same field site that I was to start um, work in two years later on the politics of water access. So while the 2005 floods were precipitated by an a sort of extremely unusual rainfall event, between 2007 and 2014, so currently, several parts of the city have been flooding following only moderate intensity rainfall, right? So floods are becoming increasingly common and increasingly dire. So the question is why? What is going on with the infrastructure? So to begin to answer this question, we have to look a little bit at the city's ecology. Bangalore has an, this, this ancient interconnected wetland system consisting of both human engineered and naturally occurring lakes or tanks uh, that date back to the founding of the city several centuries ago, 500 years ago, with no major river of its own but four major valleys draining a number of smaller streams and lakes. The city's terrain, which is very undulating, was ideally suited to creating this interlinked engineered wet wetland system. Right? The wetlands were cascading, they were interconnected through open canals, which eventually became the city's stormwater drains. This, uh, as the city uh, urbanized, um, these stormwater drains underwent several important political, economic, and ecological changes. So now this part natural and part human-made wetland system was built to sustain a highly hier hierarchical and patriarchal feudal system, one in which the domestication and control of lower castes and women went hand in hand with the domestication of monsoonal rains. However, the nature of this interlinked system, even several centuries ago, was that during times of exceptionally strong rainfall, um, there would be a domino effect whereby uh, storm overflows would, would cascade into and destroy people's settlements. And as we've seen the history of, of civilization and flooding, the, the stronger the structures you build to keep waters out, the more devastating the effects are when, it, when there's actually a flood event, right? So in fact, this system has always wielded what, what Bruce Brown and Sarah Watmore refer to as a sometimes terrifying, more than human margin of indeterminacy. And that's what we're really grappling with when we think about you know, future environmental change, is this sort of margin of indeterminacy that, that non-human agency can also wield. Now, this margin of indeterminacy and the kind of agential powers of infrastructure um, are especially uh, problematic and of concern when, when uh, infrastructure like this is enrolled in different political projects, right? So I'm going to talk about a particular change in the ways in which this infrastructure was enrolled into, a, into um, a state project, and that was really during, the first one was during colonialism. So during the height of colonialism in the late 1800s, British engineers decided to use Bangalore's original wetland system and its storm canals uh, as a way to drain the city of waste and of filth especially in the aftermath of disease outbreaks. So you see this happening in several colonial cities around the world. Um, and in, in Bangalore, it was the, the aftermath of the plague, the bubonic plague in 1896, in which wetlands were then suddenly thought of as these sanitary outlets. So of course, this was done in highly racialized ways, with poor natives being targeted for slum demolition and water and sanitation infrastructure being laid in highly segregated and uneven ways. And this, of course, set in motion the flood risk, the uneven flood risk we see today. So this is what happened in Bangalore uh, at the turn of the century. The net effect of the plague and of colonial planning was that wetlands were repurposed to sanitation drains. And so suddenly they were doing a different work. So I want to problematize the way we think about work here and also bring in the non-human here in terms of the agency and in terms of, of the capacity to, to affect uh, disaster in this case. So since, since wetlands were no longer seen as necessary for water supply by the colonial government, they started to invest in, um, they had started by that time to invest in you know, large-scale heavy engineering water projects. These, these wetland canals were used to, as, as sanitation, um, as outlets for sanitation from the colonial period onwards. And I noticed that, that this continued to happen in, into the contemporary period as, as well. As I was repeatedly told by the city's stormwater department, the Water Supply and Sewerage Board continues to locate sewer manholes within stormwater drains with grave consequences for flood risk, uh, especially in lower-lying informal areas. So you, this is a, a site that you see very commonly with, with um, sewage being channeled into 
uh, into stormwater drains or into, into the, uh, the, the erstwhile canals that collect, connected Bangalore's wetlands. Um, and, and this historic legacy has meant today, and so, you know, this is the kind of picture that really makes your stomach churn, of course, but this is the kind of dirty, di you know, dirty um, and, and, um, kind of materiality and the filth that laborers today find themselves having to deal with, right? Because of, and part of this historic legacy and the rapid urbanization of the city. So I was, I was told in vivid detail about the kind of filth and refuse that ends up in these stormwater drains. A problem that, of course, is makes it really disastrous when it rains. So everything from hospital waste to discarded furniture to colossal amounts of plastic waste ends up in the stormwater drains. Um, so much so that the acronym SWD is often taken to mean something else. As I was told by, by a stormwater engineer, Srinivas, here's our contractor, he said. You ask him, what does SWD stand for? He'll say it's sanitary water drains. Even they don't know what the original purpose of these drains were. Just imagine the filth the workmen will be immersed in while working. So he went on to tell me that it is typically migrant labor involved in cleaning the drains. And this is a kind of the standard picture you see. And um, people who uh, immigrate from drought-stricken states in India come to Bangalore to find, uh, to find day labor jobs. And so the cleaning of these stormwater drains that are so clogged with a, a number of different kinds of waste because of historic legacies is left to these migrant laborers. And it's really a race to keep up. The city is constantly trying to clear its storm drains from waste that lands up there. It's called desilting. But with the, the, you know, compounded with, this, with poor solid waste management and the conflation of stormwater and sanitary water, such dirty work often falls to the most marginalized of urban residents. Unfortunately, when it rains, the blocked nature of these drains means that, that stormwater gushes into informal settlements that usually have the worst kind of uh, upkeep as far as the drains go. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to transition now to a second really important uh, assemblage and a kind of a reassembling of socio-natural relations in the contemporary period. Um, and that is that these wetlands have been revalued as real estate. So not only were they revalued in the colonial period as sanitary outlets, but in the contemporary, in the millennial period, they've been revalued as land, as, as, as commodity. So what we see today is an intensifying relationship between storm drains and, and capital. And, 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 you know, and, and sort of uh, mediating those relations is an increasingly informalized state apparatus. So with the increasing circulation of capital in Bangalore's economy over the last decade, um, generated, of course, through the rapid growth of the IT economy, new sites of land are being commodified, and wetland, actually, are being commodified. And you of course, see that in, um, you know, in city after city where the wetlands have been eroded. In, in the case of, of, of New Orleans, the wetlands were changed by the Army Corps of Engineers, and that, of course, helped to, um, to make the, the area and, and uh, the lower lime wards particularly flood prone. So similarly, here, wetlands are being revalued as real estate in the current moment and repurposed as real estate. So the city's wetlands um, um, that, that ha have not been spared from kind of speculative real estate development and, in fact, afford the opportunity for squeezing out and commodifying additional fictitious land, to, to use a phrase from Karl Polanyi, with dire re repercussions for flood risk. So this is, um, you know, this is a, a picture of, of, a, of the South Bangalore, and the red areas are flood-prone areas, right? Critical, low-lying, flood-prone areas <coughs> that consistently face, um, you know, the, the worst kind of damage when uh, when there's monsoonal rains. And so what I did was I overlaid this GIS map with Google satellite images of the same area over the last 10 years, just to give you a sense of the kind of development just in the space of 10 years that are happening over wetland channels. And this is, this is the result of, of what the, that kind of real estate development looks like. So we have to think about how these, how these new socio-natural assemblages um, you know, are implicated in worsening environmental risk and, and urban flood risk. And, and what happens is um, this is with, with, with residents settling in these areas, there's a kind of a, a work involved, of course, in creating these settlements that um, directly comes into, um, into conflict with the kind of agency that you're seeing once it rains, um, with kind of non-human agency or this terrifying margin of indeterminacy. So flood risk that, 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 is, that, is, um, um, that is besetting the city is very uneven. It affects areas that are informal, that um, have been, um, you know, the kind of the outcome of the commodification of wetlands that, that takes place through very um, uh, legally tenuous channels. 
So we can talk a little bit more about in the question and answer session about the potential possibilities for, for kind of redirecting the labor, both human and non-human labors and, and, and allowing for more just possibilities. But what I've tried to do here is to show you through this very brief example, the ways in which storm drains have been enrolled through human labor into different socio-natural assemblages over time, but that these assemblages in turn also wield a powerful kind of agency in the production of flood risk. So I'll end it there and um, look forward to your reflections. Thanks a lot. Okay. okay, well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, so I'm gonna present today from a forthcoming paper um, from my work on the politics of municipal garbage collection in Dakar, Senegal. And my overall goal here is to argue that social and bodily technologies must be included as key elements within a wider gamut of techniques constituting urban infrastructure through literally fleshing out living the living parts of labor and community in infrastructural systems. Talking about infrastructures of labor helps us to get at all of the ways that governmental power can be exerted through infrastructures because they often crystallize uneven development, unjust power relations, and even exploitative conditions in the city. But infrastructures also serve as key sites of debate and contestation around the rights and rewards of the city and the insurgent politics that may arise as people rebel through infrastructure. So these are the two sort of general points that I wanna make um, in this presentation. But I'm particularly concerned with politicizing the fabric of the city through emphasizing materiality or the matter at stake in infrastructure, garbage in this instance, in all of its multiple dimensions. I understand infrastructure, drawing on Michelle Murphy, not as a neutral supporting structure, but as a multi-dimensional set of relational properties that become an ecology of infrastructure. Infrastructures are spatial arrangements of relationships that draw human beings, things, words, and non-humans into pattern conjunction, conjunctures. So this vital materialist understanding draws our attention to how the development, operation, and maintenance of infrastructure are intensely entangled with uh, other spheres. And we'll see that the political and the religious spheres are important in this example. So just to give you a little bit of, ex of uh, background, my research from which this is drawn examines the cultural politics of municipal garbage collection over the last 25 years in Dakar, and there are sort of three key elements, and I'm just gonna very briefly um, talk about these, characterizing what has been a very sort of uh, volatile political moment of garbage politics during this time. So the first is that this, this time has seen countless institutional reorganizations in the institutions charged with, manage, with managing uh, the city's trash. You don't have to pay too much attention to this graph, you just need to know that this represents the institutional reorganizations that have happened just over the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, <clears throat> and those have ranged from full privatization to full nationalization to a whole host of different sort of hybrid arrangements in between. So it's been a very sort of volatile institutional um, time in terms of the uh, organizations um, charged with managing the city's garbage. Also during this time, there have been frequent and prolonged garbage strikes. This is uh, one strike that took place um, in 2013, I believe, by the Union of Trash Workers of Dakar. Um, and I'm gonna talk a bit more about those trash strikes um, later. But thirdly, this time has been characterized by widespread concerted acts of public dumping. And by public dumping, what I mean is um, whole neighborhoods of people actually leaving their homes to dump their trash in the street in solidarity with the striking trash workers. So the confluence of these three very uh, intense, volatile, and very stinky, as you might imagine, um, <clears throat> sort of movements around uh, the politics of garbage have made this a really uh, sort of intensely um, uh, remarkable time. And the backdrop, and again, I can't get into this in, in detail here, uh, is neoliberal urban reform in the wake of structural adjustment. 
but neoliberal urban reform taking place in the context of a very vibrant democratic politics. And Dakar, Senegal is a very vibrant dem democratic political scene, but Dakar is the heartland of that democratic politics. Um, <clears throat> so waste in this context has taken center stage in both reform strategies and the politics that they precipitate. So my first point is about governing through garbage. I argue that over this period, differentially disciplining people through waste and the particular burdens of waste disposal has been a central mode of state power in Senegal. At the base of the volatile contestations and institutional reorganizations around municipal labor, around municipal garbage has been labor or labor politics. From the founding of the contemporary trash system in a volunteer social movement to continued efforts to undermine unionization New low-tech infrastructural formulas have aimed to flexibilize labor through a range of discourses and technologies of participation. In so doing, they have re-spatialized the relations of social reproduction and thereby devolved the burdens of doing the dirty work more firmly onto social systems and bodies, particularly youth and women. For ordinary Dakarwa, this has meant an increasing, uh, increasingly challenging burdens of managing waste in the home um, which in, in, in Senegal is generally filled with um, mainly organic matter, which in this hot climate gets very sticky and messy very quick. As a result, the poorest neighborhoods pay the most for garbage collection and become the most encumbered by garbage and the noxious dangers of waste, pollution, and disease. For workers, the flexibilization of labor conditions and inadequate remuneration has meant increasingly precarious working conditions. So before I change slides, I just want to point out that this is a very sort of intentional juxtaposition here, which if you're a scholar of Senegal or if you've been to Senegal, and I know some of you have, um, <clears throat> represents uh, sort of a lot of what I'm trying to get at here with the governing garbage argument. So you've got some women walking in front of a depot sauvage or a uh, sort of dump, you know, informal trash um, <clears throat> dump representing the sort of inability of the collection circuit to, to work in this particular neighborhood. But in the background, you have this incredible statue, and this is when it was um, still um, underway, that represents sort of all of the hubris that was associated with the past president, the president, Abdullahi Wad, who was in charge of Senegal from 2000 to 2012. Um, and so his sort of idea of infrastructure is very much seen as kind of this elitist vision that didn't actually represent um, the needs of, of people in Senegal as sort of uh, symbolized by this really, really ugly statue that everybody hates <laughs> and the sort of inability to actually uh, provide urban public services for the, the residents of Dakar. So garbage workers have borne the brunt of this labor intensive infrastructure through the onerous demands of the work itself, associated diseases, and the stigma of laboring in filth. The materiality of the labor process matters for the bo bodies of the workers doing the dirty work. Generally lacking in protective uh, clothing and proper equipment, they stand nakedly exposed to an array of harms and shoulder disproportionate burdens of disease. So here's an example of the material intimacy this precipitates between workers and the machines that they depend on. The central pillar of the material technology of this system is the garbage truck, but trucks are a rickety, dilapidated material scaffolding. Most arrive used from Europe already in disrepair, and once put to work in Senegal, they face the wear and tear caused by poor roads, lack of maintenance, and overcharged loads. The disintegration of the infrastructure steel precipitates incessant, incessant expert physical labors of salvage bricolage. Like bricoleur all over the co continent, trash workers have no choice but to, transform, but to transform someone else's rubbish infrastructure into new utility. These workers are infrastructure hackers, manipulating the system's steel architre architecture through fastening their own bodies to the truck's dysfunctional steel plates. The bodies and the machines conform to each other's labors as the workers employ their own arms as artificial limbs for the ailing trucks. The dangers of such intimacy are cleanly written on the bodies of the collectors in their scars, bruises, even missing limbs. My point here is that far from becoming more high-tech, 
many infrastructures, particularly in the global south, are being devolved onto labor and thereby burden certain people with the work of building and maintaining the city. In Dakar, this is the product of a particular confluence of the logics of austerity and political contestation at the urban level. In that context, labor-intensive participatory waste infrastructures have come, to become, have come to be a central pillar of governing practices forged through the literal emplacement of burdens of disease and dirt onto specific bodies and spaces. This history of flexibilization of labor in Dakar underscores what Cindy Katz has called the fleshy, messy aspects of the crisis of social reproduction as it operates through the burdens of labor's materiality. Just as new advanced technologies reconfigure social relations, so do gaps in infrastructure and the devolution to lower technologies operate as means of control. This, of course, has not gone uncontested. So the second point I want to make here is that the intimacy among workers, residents, and wastes materiality provides the grounds on which to mobilize claims for Im improved urban labor conditions and public services. Um, so the trash workers of Dakar formed a labor union in 2000, and in 2006 began striking um, quite uh, vociferously using the general trash strike where they stop picking up the city's trash as their main lever um, to voice some to voice their grievances about poor remuneration lack of contracts and lack of benefits um, through this process they've actually become one of the most visible unions in contemporary senegal um, <clears throat> and they have inspired these sort of neighborhood trash revolts through which whole neighborhoods have dumped their own trash in solidarity with the workers so workers and residents in Dakar have exerted their rights to urban citizenship through creatively manifesting disorder to contest the governing prerogatives of government officials and all of the associated dimensions of stigma and objection implied by living and working in filth. Through intentionally externalizing private trash into public spaces, they deploy the power of dirt to unsettle the ordering paradigms implied by participatory labor arrangements to argue for a sort of garbage citizenship that includes fair remuneration and benefits for garbage labor and affordable, accessible garbage services. These claims to garbage citizenship have, in, in turn, provided a language to contest uneven infrastructures and the flexibilization of labor in Dakar in general. Beyond their, lever as, beyond their power as a lever of contestation, Dakar's strikes reveal the social infrastructure that binds the workers together. I just want to point out that this is the leader of uh, the Municipal Trash Workers Union, Madani Si, who's a very sort of charismatic kind of in organic intellectual. And he has, at, at his helm, the union has managed to sort of catapult their, uh, the vision of the union to the forefront of um, a lot of, uh, uh, political debates, but also it's been um, sort of in the presses um, quite a bit over the last uh, 12 years. Um, but in the context of their profound insecurity, one is struck by the workers' intense camaraderie and solidarity. In many instances, groups of workers band together to help out a colleague in need through picking up the slack on the job or helping out with medical bills. But the trash workers' solidarity is also buttressed by something else their common faith and conviction that the labor of cleaning the city is a pious act. Undergirding the shared material and labor infrastructure of garbage collection is an architecture of faith that, give them, that gives the movement its moral authority. If cleanliness is godliness, they argue, then those who work day in and day out to purge Dakar of its impurities should be rewarded in the here and now for this noble deed. The reward due is simple respect, job stability, and fair pay. In this way, the workers turn the stigma of trash work on its head. Forging an understanding of trash work as a service of purification validates their labor and creates a platform for making claims on the state in an era when politicians are strongly distrusted, but where faith and communal religious identity re remains an enormous personal and collective resource. Um, and since 2009, they've actually gained a number of key concessions including um, 
formal contracts and benefits, including medical coverage and sick pay. And then um, last summer, summer of 2014, they actually formed a collective bargaining agreement with the uh, mayor of Dakar. So that was like a huge, a huge win. So to conclude, I wanna just emphasize how the case of garbage in Dakar makes clear how we have to think about all of the dimensions of infrastructure. Beyond just trucks in the city dump, infrastructures of disposal are comprised of a complex ecology of material objects and human labor, tethered together through their effective registers, architectures of faith, and political actualities. The politics of garbage in Dakar reveals that the things, living bodies, and values that make up trash infrastructures can operate as performative vehicles of emergent agendas of both governing and rebellion. I focused here on labor's materiality in order to probe the burdens of infrastructure. Discard labor, in particular, crystallizes the value work manifested in structures of vulnerability. It also raises all manner of critical questions for the deployment of discourses of participation and community in practices of governing. Laid bare are the particularly dirty contradictions ushered forth in the era of austerity, the burdens of participation and bricolage are borne on workers' bodies in the scars, impurities, and stigmas they carry along. But the vibrant struggles around garbage in Dakar also illuminate a potent example of how degraded or discarded subjects critique the expert knowledge complicit in their own subjugation. Waste's powers to disrupt in the salience of its opposite cleanliness as a symbol of faith and piety motivates collective attachments of all kinds in all sorts of unpredictable ways. Perhaps the most important lesson to learn from Dakar's trash workers then is their battle to make their labor manifest or visible and to sculpt a vernacular understanding of its worth. In so doing, they demand a remoralization of work and state claims for a more ethical urban infrastructure. Thank you. So thank you. Um, Thanks uh, to the Urban Democracy Lab and to these fantastic panelists for these papers. I, I come at this from a Labor Studies Institute, and as Kafui mentioned at the beginning, there's a big push inside of the labor movement in the United States today to be thinking about uh, infrastructure as a main site for activism. Um, one, because of the excellent green jobs that such uh, 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 infrastructures allow here. Um, in the United States context. If we were to invest enormous amounts of money inside of the infrastructures in the United States, we would have, you know, we would stop wasting as much water as we waste, uh, we would use less energy, et cetera. And because these are largely public sector jobs that are well paid and unionized, it would be a great way to maintain living standards for, for workers in the US. So that's my kind of take on infrastructure. And when I was invited to moderate this panel, I was really amazed and um, excited by all the things that I read and heard today. Uh, the, the arguments that we heard here ask us to be thinking about infrastructure at a deeper and more nuanced um, way. They are making visible a social phenomenon that, as many of them pointed to inside of their own talks, is often just thought of as background that we don't really think about. And in fact, the invisibility of infrastructure, I think, and I'd love for the panelists to think about this as they already have, but perhaps speak about it out loud, the invisibility of infrastructure often kind of serves the status quo of the powers that the infrastructures um, are, are governed through and by. Uh, and it's making the infrastructure vis visible and the way that it works the power relations that these infrastructures embody, um, the grim stories sometimes of exploitation, of despoilment, of environmental destruction that these infrastructures both you know, prevent, but in some cases, like Melanie's uh, position, open up. Um, making these visible, and then also making visible the ways in which inf infrastructure opens up sites for resistance, um, opens up sites for contestation, for negotiation, and for struggle, and for visionary new ways of thinking about how society can be built from the ground up. Um, 
these papers made me have a much kind of broader way of thinking about infrastructure in the way that I have uh, compared to the way that I've typically thought about it. So I want to thank you all for that. Um, and I will have some questions as we go along, but I'm hoping that we can hear from all of you and you can ask your questions as well. Hi. Okay. <laughs> um, so I guess my question is for anybody. Um, based on the past couple of weeks of protests that have been happening around the city and around the country that have been targeting infrastructure in sort of kind of, to me, really original and unique ways. I mean, there, there's precedence for them, but, um, you know, people have been in this city going onto highways, um, going onto bridges, blocking them. Just this morning, the Staten Island Expressway was closed, which has probably never been closed by a protest before. So these are all, I, I think, really amazing protests um, that are sort of getting at the sort of sim making visible the invisible, like Penny just said, getting at the symbolic um, value that highways have in this country as sort of, you know, um, I mean, they're conduits for the military industrial complex. Originally, they're also forces of racial segregation. So I think that the protests are really appropriate. Um, but it seems like in, in what all of you are talking about, the, the protests around infrastructure are sort of more directly targeted by people who have a labor connection to them, um, to the, the bits of infrastructure. Well, maybe not everybody's talk, but um, I wonder if you have thoughts about these protests that we're, ha or that we're seeing right now where the people who are doing them are just sort of seizing a, a, an opportunity that just kind of is in front of them and they don't necessarily have any sort of direct or organic connection to the infrastructure itself. You know, it's not like a, 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 a labor, a typical labor protest, even like a, a port shutdown or something, which I think might be a precedent for some of what we're seeing. Um, but it's, it's kind of of a different character um, in that way because of the, because it's just anybody can do it really and that's what's happening, that's what we're seeing. So that's my question. And we can take a couple of questions at once and the panelists can come back, so that is awesome. Uh, this is for uh, Rosalind. Uh, so just building on this, I was thinking of the 1968 Memphis sanitation strike in terms of thinking about the uh, garbage workers that you were studying. And I was just curious, it seems like the infrastructure is so affected by neoliberalism, but I was curious, there's so much in common across the sort of garbage strike. The Memphis strike was started by, you know, two workers were crushed in the um, in a truck that malfunctioned. And, you know, it just, it seemed like a lot of the sorts of uh, moral claims and, and claims to like human rights and, you know, race and class and, and things like that were, were in common across those cases. Well, I can just quickly respond to that. Yeah, sure. well, people germinate, ruminate. Um, no, I mean, I think that's absolutely correct. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of resonances across, you know, many different sort of historical time periods and kind of geographical spaces. Um, and I do think there's something, I haven't done a, a you know, <clears throat> a sort of explicit comparison of the two, but I do think there's a lot um, to be compared there about the sort of politics of manifestation, which I think is what we're getting at here, um, which is both about sort of rendering visible, rendering legible that which is, you know, taken for granted, seen as background, um, seen as sort of material scaffolding, but not as body, as, you know, um, community, as um, aspiration, as desire, all of that. Um, between those two examples, absolutely. Um, and I do think that that connects quite a bit with this previous comment about sort of why the sort of, you know, where these protests take place, where these acts of manifestation take place, and sort of why that 
um, enters a, a certain sort of public sphere. Um, and I do think that it's not an accident that uh, sort of politics of manifestation in these different forms takes place sort of in the very hard, uh, you know, architectures, very hard sort of scaffolding that is um, seen as the kind of persistent, you know, product of of the state, you know, for um, and <clears throat> the these these protests have actually reminded me quite a bit of. Um, one of the ways that the uh, some of the rappers in Dakar, so my new project is on is on rappers. Um, they often um, uh, they often film their uh, their videos and their clips in like big state infrastructures, so on overpasses and that sort of thing. And this is in the context of an environment where things like overpasses are seen as um, you know um, sort of absurd, um, elitist places to spend money, but as the sort of symbol of the state's negligence, of, this, of, of, the, of the state's sort of um, <clears throat> rejection of a sort of more uh, people's infrastructure, that sort of thing. So they're certainly doing that in, in those places. And I think there's some sort of a connection here with what we're seeing around the um, politics of manifestation here that is, I think, a critique of the big web um, that constitutes sort of state power in all the ways that it is being seen to be negligent, being seen to be reprehensible in this particular moment. So that's one thought on that. I'm sure other people. And, yeah, if yeah. I could just build on that really excellent question. I think um, what I didn't present on today, my previous work has really looked at citizenship struggles around water access and, um, and um, and how water infrastructure is a site for citizenship struggles. But I think what, and, and, and in, this, in this work as well, sort of, um, you know, the, the uh, increased flooding in the city has, has initiated struggles around the right to a, a safe city. And so in answer to your question, I think infrastructure lays bare the many ways in which people claim the right to the city. And so even in the most recent protests that we've seen, coming out on bridges and using infrastructure in ingenious ways, I think points at the many different creative, insurgent ways in which people uh, use infrastructure to vocalize claims about the right to the city. But I think that also pushes us as academics and activists to think about, well, what does the right to the city really mean? And how is kind of the material use of infrastructure broadening out our conception of the right to the city? So, so while, while, although I study a very different context, and as you said, it's a very literal connection to infrastructure. It's like water or it's strong water infrastructure, and it's for that sake. But still, that is, a, you know, a claim about the right to a safe, equitable city, you know, and its materialities. Whereas in this case, in the examples you just cited, it's it's infrastructure as a conduit to articulating claims about the right to the city. But I think, as Ravi said, in a, in a kind of, you know, these web of connections, to just see these spaces as, as, as conduits uh, um, and as kind of the materiality where this stuff happens is really useful. And, and yeah, very nice question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have anything else on the Stuart's question? Well, the Stuart's question actually reminded me of your book title the, uh, and the link between uh, cities or, you know, strategies you might use to shut down a factory machinery of a factory and the kind of machinery of cities like the streets. So. When our book comes out, we have a chapter on it, yes. <laughs> in fact. <laughs> okay, so we'll take some more questions and come back. Yeah, hi. Um, I think I have a pretty basic question. I'm interested in each of your, any of it's open to anyone, um, definitions of infrastructure. Some of you have used more explicit definitions, others more implicit definitions. Um, and it seems like it's really diverse. There's bodies and trains and stormwater, and then also houses maybe expanded into lungs. And I'm interested in kind of um, how you're defining infrastructure and the way that you've used it in your research now, why you made the decision, and what you feel sort of like the stakes in making that decision about the definition of infrastructure. And if you want to, compare it and contrast it to some of your other panelists. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I had a couple of questions, actually, also. Um, for Rosalind Fredericks, I was wondering if you had any um, 
sort of like thoughts on the parallels between Dakar and New York as far as garbage sort of like as something that we deal with on day to day. Um, I couldn't help but notice you mentioned the statue that they're putting up or have put up in Dakar and that in New York we have some interesting new landmarks that like also point to a certain level of hubris, like the new tallest building on Park Avenue, you know, and as a society, we and a city, we tend to spend a lot of money on very peculiar projects. And at the same time, you know, trash, you know, in New York is sort of like maybe not nearly as modern or as efficient as even other international cities that compare as a first class city. Never mind sort of the most breakthrough technological advancements like um, I know they have like vacuum like trash collection systems and all sorts of things that could redefine how labor is dedicated to that. And also for Detroit, I was wondering, um, I can't remember if you mentioned this, but if there was actually a demolition method that is completely safe as far as lead removal is concerned or if that's still actually a mystery, sort of like something we're stuck with. Um, and then also if you had any comment on like, you know, in these cities that are going from housing back to fields, like one of the hot topics is urban farming. And if you're farming on land that is contaminated with lead, you know, that could have some pretty, um, I guess, devastating consequences like down the road. Um, so if you have any comments on that, you know, that would be great. Thanks. Um, I had a question, I guess, that's sort of building on the definitional one. So infrastructure has become kind of a hot topic, at least in urban studies, which is my field. And so I've spent a lot of time trying to think about why um, and what we're doing with it. And so this is an open-ended question for anyone. I guess I was just wondering if any of you could reflect on its current popularity and what you think that's about and what you think we get from it as scholars, sort of analytically or as, as a sort of methodological approach or kind of what you're, and I would also invite Catherine to talk about sweetness because I'm quite interested. In so you asked a question Chris, about infrastructure, how people are defining it and how we came to it as an analytical category, is that right? Um, sorry, I don't see myself as an anthropologist of infrastructure, um, I, but strangely I, I feel um, pleasantly co-opted by the movement. Um, I guess I turned to questions of housing because I wanted to think about um, uh, material forms that bring bodies into relation with each other, right? And what, what intrigued me about where I worked, not in Detroit, but actually in this earlier project on public housing on the west side of Chicago, was that the sort of standard ways of organizing and mobilizing um, around housing, which have been since the 1960s um, arguments about racial discrimination no longer stuck, right? So, so it didn't actually work in court, which becomes the sort of main place where people actually argue for, for, um, for rights to sound housing. Um, and what intrigued me was that instead of questions about racial discrimination or claims of racial discrimination, which were made in private, which were made you know, casually, but in formal scenarios, people would make a claim to being harmed by various kinds of in infrastructures, right? So I've written a lot about heating infrastructure and building decay, and so these became the things that people were sort of fixating on and organizing around. And so um, for me, uh, what's intriguing about this concept, if you want to think about it as any kind of form, and it doesn't have to be material, right, but any kind of form that brings two or three or four or whatever entities into relation to each other, is that you're forced to actually move outside of these kinds of very, you know, important, but what in some ways, I mean, again, I'm not going to say this this week, but maybe, so what in some ways are very sort of like stagnant ways of organizing, right? Um, so in this country around class and race. Again, like this whole past few weeks throws us out the window. But, th but so I want to think like, are, are the ways that we have for thinking about social difference in this country, do they need sort of retooling? And looking at something that explicitly asks us to think about the relations between bodies and objects um, and the kinds of claims that emerge from that allow us still to talk about racial discrimination and its effects, but in a different vocabulary. Um, that that my interlocutors found had much more legal traction. So that so I think about infrastructure as any kind of entity that brings two or, two or more entities in relation to one another. Um, 
why why infrastructure why now was the question um you know i just came back from a workshop where this question was posed and like preoccupied us for like three days straight um constantly and there were a number of, I'll, I'll tell you what people said there were a number of different things that came up um someone suggested this has to do with um um the inability of an anthropologist to talk about pure forms of difference right this is sort of cynical you know answer right we cannot no longer talk about such and such people, but we can talk about objects that might be associated with them. I think that's a cynical read, and I think it's possible, but not entirely fair. Um, someone else suggested, and I think this is quite interesting, is that it's a, a moment where people are starting to, where, where analysts, right, where social scientists, where people in the humanities are trying to think through the magnitude of something like um, climate change, right? How does one begin to wrap their head around that? And that these kinds of turns to the material, to the infrastructural, Etc. are ways to start conceptualizing and conceptually arming ourselves for conceptualizing floods and the Anthropocene and climate change and all these sorts of non-human entities that you know obviously have human entanglements. Um, you know, I think uh, one thing that's super exciting about it is that it allows for, if we take embodiment seriously and not just a sort of arrangement of bodies, but actually that bodies are formed through their movement in built environments, we can start to begin to talk about something like our co-substantiation with other entities, right? So we all in this country share some kind of radioactive material in our bodies, and some, a lot of us have lead, right? So how do we begin thinking about the distribution of these entities? So um, there are more questions, but I'm going to stop there because I, I know that other people want to get on this. Thank you. Um, well, I have a slightly narrower definition of infrastructure. Um, to me, uh, infrastructure is a socio-technical artifact infused with power um, and that's in, something that's involved in the production of differentiated space. Um, and so obviously this comes from a place uh, of my research where I look at um, large socio-technical systems like water and stormwater and, and so that's the definition that, that I think most resonates with me but of course there's been post-colonial scholars that have actually talked about uh, people as infrastructure like Abdul Malik Simon. Uh, in, the, in, in the case of, of, of post-colonial Africa. So, so I think that people come at it with, with, with different um, lenses and definitions. I mean, I liked, I liked what you said about you know, something that, that connects two points or, or something that, that connects uh, two actors, if you, if you can put it that way as well. Um, but but, I, but, but, but I, think, I think the, the, the socio-technicality of it, or the fact that, that the social is kind of completely in repay with the technical in infrastructures is, 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 is very core to the way I define it. Um, it's interesting you were asking why infrastructure now because I feel I feel as if infrastructure was very current when I started my dissertation you know several years ago with the publication of you know Graham and Marvin's book uh, Splintering Urbanism that where where it was a very sort of sociological look at infrastructure but then earlier than that Susan Lay Starr's ethnographies of infrastructure right so it's been a current topic and I, and I really like the way she puts it you know it's really it's it's these mundane objects that really lay bare power relations right and so social scientists who are interested in justice, who are interested you know, in, in critically analyzing power relations in history, have to look at these mundane objects because the more mundane it is, the more we take it for granted, right? So I, I think it's been, a current, it's been a debate for a while, it's been a topic for a while, but the, for me, the exciting resurgence is really the application of post-colonial theory to infrastructure. And the idea, a, a critique of Graham and Marvin's book is, is not that the modern infrastructural ideal, this idea of, of seamless kind of interconnected systems uh, that, that were uh, that prevailed for the 20th century have fallen apart due to neoliberalism, but rather in the colonial world, post-colonial world, there was never a modern infrastructural ideal, right? Infrastructures were all, always differentially produced. And so now it's a question how those differential infrastructures articulate with market-based paradigms, right? And, and, and there's, in the, in the post-colonial world, there's no, there's no sense of sort of the formal and the, and the, inf and the, the, the legal and the illegal. It's a spectrum of like informality, right? And so I think, I think post-colonial theory really Really, ha really brings to that conversation something different that wasn't in the kind of earlier discussion of infrastructure. Um, that, that to me is the more, most exciting part about the, 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 the social science, critical social science of infrastructure. Uh, I, I guess I didn't know that infrastructure was hot, and I don't know if I have a definition. <laughs> so, but I know that at least when I started, when I was in graduate school, the, the, the thing that people kept the, re the reference was built environment or the built environment, and and I'm not sure what the relationship between infrastructure and the built environment is, but that's kind of what I what got what interested me uh, early on, and 
what interested me was in many ways what Camille uh, yeah. said. What? Cassie. Cassie. Jeez. <laughs> Cassie. Sorry. That's the Catherine Cassie. Cassie, yeah. <laughs> Cassie was saying, which was that I was really interested in struggles over over objects in the city. And the first thing I got interested in was the uh, history of the wheelchair lift on buses mm -hmm. and the struggle of um, people with disabilities for wheelchair lifts, which was a very kind of infrastructural thing that was uh, central to access in the city. So, um, but in terms of a definition, I, I like the ones I've heard. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I would um, just build on those uh, comments, especially Malini, the way that you were sort of um, tracing the sort of genealogy of the concept as it's emerged in urban studies um, more recently and just kind of start where you ended at your, your last point, which is this kind of reclamation of um, infrastructures by a certain sort of kind of urban um, post-colonial scholarship. Um, and I think, you know, one of the ways that <clears throat> this, this particular literature has sort of reclaimed infrastructure, critiqued the kind of splintering infrastructure, networked infrastructure idea has been through very much forwarding um, this notion of, of sort of people as infrastructure, right? Like the, in the non-networked South, in the informal South, there are other kinds of infrastructure. Um, and I think part of the, the, the power of that uh, process of reclamation was to sort of name something that wasn't being considered sort of solid enough, right? It was a way of kind of giving <coughs> the informal, um, the power of infrastructure, this big sort of, you know, <clears throat> word that we associate with, you know, big scale modernizing projects, et cetera. And so I think that that move made by Abdul Malik Simone and others to sort of call it infrastructure, even if it's informal, even if it's people based, even if it's labor intensive, was um, aimed at, you know, sort of uh, re resisting the, the sort of idea of the absence of infrastructure or the absence of institutions even in the global south, et cetera. But I think my take on that is is a little bit um, sort of different, and I'm I'm definitely working with the idea of people as infrastructure, and I've have been you know very um, sort of formed, I guess, um, and informed and inspired to some degree by um, ideas like Simone's and others. But I think part of the problem with that is that it it's it's too optimistic, and it's and it has this sort of notion of. Um, <clears throat> sort of blindly giving structure to something without thinking about um, what, uh, you know, what um, structures that structure, how, how, how you can actually define that structure. And so th that's where I then, and this is kind of in the definitional answer, have turned to what I think has been a really generative scholarship coming from a sort of STS-inspired literature that's thinking about the materiality of infrastructure and saying we have to pick apart even that black box of people as infrastructure and say, how is um, how are these so-called structures um, material and what can we what can we learn from that? And I, I think what that does, obviously, as you saw in my paper, in terms of the arts of infrastructure, arts of um, sorry, the uh, people as infrastructure argument is to say, this isn't always good, right? This isn't always positive. It isn't always something that we need to celebrate. People as infrastructure can be a profoundly um, sort of burdensome um, a, a state for a city, for urban practice, et cetera. But you also miss, you know, there still is this bifurcation between the sort of social and the built environment, right? Um, and I think Abdul Malik Simone, in a way, goes so far into saying um, <clears throat> that people are infrastructure that he sort of forgets the built environment. And he wants so much to claim that, um, you know, these social groupings that are making the city are an infrastructure, are an architecture, that he's sort of actually missing the interlinkages between the built and the social. And that's what I get from the kind of social science, the STS inspiration there is in really thinking about the imbrication and that's why I'm so interested in this question of the ways that people and their machines and their infrastructures and their overpasses literally conform to each other in the ways that um, you know you get uh, sort of different forms of agency beyond um, people you get this sort of um, non-human um, forms of, of, of agency that really resist the separation between the built and the, the social the built um, city and the, the, the kind of social city. And then that just, you know, just to kind of get to your question, I think 
is one of the ways that I think about something like a comparison between Dakar and New York. And I think infrastructure helps you get there if you're thinking in these broad terms where infrastructure can be a, a, an assemblage, an ecology that is both the built and the social and the bodies and the effective and the discursive and the cosmological, as I'm sort of pointing out there, is that you can look at that in all these different settings without getting this pejorative global south infrastructure versus global north, et cetera. Um, and I think a lot about trash infrastructures in New York. I'm actually teaching a class, a couple of people are in it um, here about um, trash in general around the globe. Um, and we've been reading a lot about New York and it was the first time that I had actually ever read a lot of this stuff and learned that you know the city of New York to a degree that I had never imagined was built literally on trash, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I think going back to um, sort of the power of this definition, I think a sort of broader understanding of uh, infrastructure can help us make these helpful comparisons that I think are so crucial to a sort of new urban studies that resist this sort of southern versus northern um, distinction. And you can raise all of these sorts of really provocative questions about what we see in these forms of imprecation, imbrication as they take place in you know, these different sectors of the globe, uh, but have all this stuff in common. And of course, um, you may know if you've read um, about trash in New York, there's this book that uh, our colleague Robin Nagel just put out called Picking Up, um, which is about the trash workers of New York. And she's really, I think she's, you know, um, not necessarily working uh, exactly with the same definition of infrastructure that we're getting at, but I do think that she goes pretty far in looking at the ways that um, the municipal workers, sanitary workers are rendered invisible, are a sort of invisible, illegible infrastructure, et cetera, that is actually very comparable to Dakar in all sorts of interesting and juicy ways. So I think a lot about that comparison, and um, yeah, I have a lot more to say about that, but great question. Mm -hmm. um, before we take more questions, Cassie, um, do you have an answer for the, are there other ways to remediate lead? Yeah, um, the way that people would like to do is, is through, which is with interest to is through a process called building deconstruction. Um, it's, it's not Derridian, it's just actually like picking apart the building um, from top to bottom <laughs> um, to reuse most of the materials that can be salvaged. And what's attractive about it is that it actually requires quite a skilled labor force, mm. which is how I actually got interested mm. in this. Um, the thought here is that, um, uh, a quite eager labor force would be the sort of like the army of ex-felons, right, who live in these cities and who are kind of shut out um, because of their records or because of sort of the ethnic or racial exclusions of the unions into building and building practices. So, you know, it's a potentially an area, so it's kind of waste processing. Um, um, so that's the thought, you would sort of take it apart piece by piece, so you're not kicking up the kind of dust that's required. Um, it's, it's uh, municipalities don't want to spend the money on it because it is more expensive. Um, so it's probably going to emerge in some place like Detroit as a kind of hybrid that they're calling skimming. Um, so the, the language of extraction is actually really interesting here because these are materials that have already been extracted once through the kind of moment of settler colonialism felling these forests. But um, it's called skimming, so you would do a kind of pick out the obvious materials that might have some value, um, like banisters and floors are sort of big interior beams. Um, bricks, there's a huge market in bricks um, in sort of Chicago and Detroit bricks that go to Arizona and all sorts of stuff. And then you would throw a, a wrecking ball or a, a claw at it with, with water. So you kind of get the kind of cost effectiveness, but you put some people to work and you salvage some materials. So that's the thought. Um, and you asked about the gardening. Yeah, I, I am surprised at this as well. I've heard people say some very shocking things, like uh, I know there's lead in the soil, but it's better to eat this zucchini than a bag of potato chips, which I normally have for lunch. So I don't know what to make of that. It's not something I focused on, but I know I found it alarming, and this was said more than several times. So it's kind of like risk with, with even like what you're choosing to put in your body, but I mean, the sort of, there's a widespread awareness of lead. So this is kind of you know, a joke, but not a joke that mm -hmm. people have written up. Um, we have time for a few more questions in the back. Yeah. Do you want the, is that Daniel? Yeah, Daniel. Oh. And folks over back. Yeah, I, I have a question about your uh, the metaphors, and I'm thinking, you know, on on the one hand, people are talking about the importance of making infrastructures visible, and it reminds me of the you know the idea of the Enlightenment, but you know, bringing things to light. And think about this great quote that I found on my phone, not that I've memorized. 
where you know Michelle Rose Trio, the anthropologist, says the ultimate uh, mark of power is invisibility. The ultimate challenge is the exposure of its roots. Um, I feel that that is a, you know that is an idea where you make something visible as a form of debunking. But my feeling when I read a lot of the work on infrastructure and you know, in this panel today, all these great arguments, it seems they're not so much like debunking power relations so much as like rebunking them and showing that in some ways these you know forms of power are far more obstinate or, um, or ubiquitous than one might have realized to the point that we even ascribe agency to them. And so if that's true, I wonder, you know, does the metaphor of illumination actually work anymore? Um, does, it, does it still make sense? Does the kind of moral charge that it carries, is that really consistent with the arguments being made? And, and if not, then do we need to think about other metaphors for knowledge and discovery? <laughs> Hello, okay. <laughs> um, my question is uh, related to the context of New York and also um, is kind of about the political processes and the political tools we can use to build better infrastructure or infrastructure that's more attentive to perhaps like traditionally marginalized populations. And I think right now is an interesting time to be asking that in New York City because um, of the mayor's agenda to create so much new, um, so many new units of affordable housing um, that will, you know, perhaps create, I mean, it will create housing opportunities for people who didn't have those types of opportunities before, but will also fundamentally reorganize neighborhoods and change space or spatial infrastructures in new ways. Um, and I'm sure that neighborhoods and people might kind of like people in neighborhoods or just urban residents are always reacting to infrastructures that are imposed by political bodies. So I'm wondering, you know, does as like do like should politicians pay more attention to what's happening in between the spaces of more formal infrastructure or, you know, or when you're creating infrastructure for those who might potentially traditionally be marginalized, how do you account for existing infrastructures? I don't know if that's a well-formed enough question, but that's that's the direction I'm going. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Yeah, just one more. I think we have time for, and then you guys can each take like a couple minutes to mm -hmm. respond and wrap up. So. Well, thank you for these wonderful presentations, actually. Uh, it was super generative. And um, yeah, and actually a lot of points of congruence and some interesting divergences, too. Um, but I wanted to ask, a, a, I guess, a question about the political stakes uh, methodologically and p political stakes writ large for everybody. Um, so, the, um, for, so the more STS question I had during the presentation was that I was wondering if in your field sites, um, what would be examples of infrastructures agency resisting enrollment in some of these dominant projects? Because we had, I heard reference to neoliberalism, colonialism, racism, capitalism. These are all projects that bring together heterogeneous elements also. And infrastructure is physical, it's unbending, and there must be times in which it doesn't go along with that. Uh, and dominant projects, or whatever it may be in the particular case, have to, must be affected in some way if the agency and the materiality argument holds. And my question for Kafui, who actually, incidentally, had one of the most uh, very clearly materialist physical argument, which was the human body's limit. Um, so, but my, I had a question about the political stakes for you, which is this must come through in the discussions within unions about transportation, the old community labor divide. There is, there must be arguments made sometimes that a speed up must be good for residents who have greater uh, mobility uh, and cheaper bus fares and breaking unions must be better. You know, you hear these kinds of arguments in, in lots of contexts, but I wonder how it comes up uh, in, your, in your research and in, in what responses are.
question about the community labor um, alliances and tensions. I think that you're right, it is a tension. Um, oftentimes, I think that one of the examples I used was uh, one person in a wheelchair or one person who's asking for directions can mean you lose your uh, bathroom break, for example. So yes, that is a problem. And I think the, um, the role that the strategy that the ATU 192 local has used is been the enlightenment project. It's been about making uh, bladders visible <laughs> to the public <laughs> and people's ability and drivers need to pee uh, um, visible. And so some of that comes in uh, performances like by Titus Warren. In that same, um, in that same uh, meeting, they had a bedpan or like a, you know, like a little trough uh, to, for, to be in. Uh, so it's a lot of like, like um, uh, theatrics around showing the need for people to be. Um, but yeah, it's, a, the, it's not the only tension between drivers and the community, but it is one that they're trying to address by um, making it visible and asking for more money <laughs> for transit, which would allow more buses, which would mean more um, uh, more recovery time and more spot time. Do you want to speak to any of the other? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot there. I mean, these have been incredibly rich um, questions. I mean, on the the question of sort of is this re rebunking infrastructures, and there's sort of a I don't know, there's sort of a, a flavor of like the bunker almost in your question there. And, and, and I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think that, um, I mean, I think that I, I would sort of disagree. I, I mean, I, I certainly, um, we shouldn't get overly obsessed with um, certain concepts to, at the expense of, of other important, um, you know, devices for, for, for thinking through important things. But I do think that one of the sort of benefits or one of the promises of this new sort of widened um, <clears throat> understanding of infrastructure is that it, it isn't just about hardening, right? It's about um, sort of bringing in all of the soft tissue pieces that are both bodies and communities and all of the dust that you can't even sort of imagine um, is part of an infrastructure into the purview of what we're thinking about and considering. And a number of the um, panelists actually spoke of a sort of um, a, 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 a kind of um, a different kind of temporal um, <clears throat> understanding of infrastructure that I think is part of uh, this broadening, this sort of widening of, of the purview that I'm referring to. And I think that's that's one way of sort of resisting the, the, the bunker or not um, <clears throat> re rebunking infrastructures is, you know, really broadening out how we're thinking about them, how we're thinking about the longevity, the history, the sort of origins of, of where these things came from and where they're going and how we're interacting with them. And then to the question of sort of how to build more equitable infrastructures, I would sort of connect the previous to this comment and just say that I think you pointed out a number of the, I mean, I think you, you answered your question in a lot of ways in the sense that I think what um, scholars of more sort of just infrastructures are, are saying is, is necessary is this, um, you know, is paying attention to the space in between, is paying attention to the soft tissue, to the junctures, to the ligaments, to the people and the ideas and the <clears throat> dreams that are embodied in inf infrastructure. And I guess I would just add to that a little bit more attention to the latter, which is, you know, how do people value their, their infrastructure and how that becomes important as city planners think about what to build and why they're gonna build it is the obvious question of thinking about what um, those those buildings might mean to actual human bodies as they interact with them, but also to our, you know, hopes and dreams as urban citizens who are looking for certain kinds of cities. Um, and then to John Paolo's question, I mean, I think this is a really, you know, provocative um, sort of way to think about um, the, you know, the, um, the agency. And I know a lot of people have issues with sort of ascribing that word to um, non-human actants, but um, 
is this question of sort of what, you know, in what ways don't infrastructure sort of comply with these insurgent projects, for instance? And I think that the, the answer is exactly sort of about the ways that these non-human actants like do act, right? Like they act all the time, whether it's from um, <clears throat> the garbage trucks that I look at that are um, confounding the hackers, the bricoleurs every day who may have, you know, practiced yeah. and practiced their art, but then get a limb torn out, torn off because the truck just acted a different way one day, or the water meters that Antina von Schnitzler talks about in um, sort of insurgent politics around privatized water in South Africa that sort of sometimes work, sometimes don't in that political project. I think there's a sort of host of, um, <clears throat> I mean, there's a, 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 you know, unlimited sort of set of examples there, but the, the way you can sort of get at them is through thinking about this sort of non-human agency and the way that these structures can conform to us, we can conform to them, but only to a certain degree. And what we have to look at is where, you know, where th that disconnect takes place. Well, first to the excellent grad student type question, which are always, of course, the best question. Um, I actually thought you made a really important point, which is, um, is this idea that infrastructure is invisible, does it really hold? And what are we, what we're doing is, is sort of really rendering visible and illuminating. Is that really a good metaphor? And I, I agree with your provocation. I think Colin McFarland has said that this whole idea that infrastructure is invisible really only holds for your American uh, context because they're so in your face everywhere. I mean, you're tripping over, you know, you're, if you live in a slum, you're living right on the sewage pipeline, you could be tripping over wires. I mean, they're so in your face, they're so above ground. They're not concealed in, in hidden networks, right? They're really in your face. So therefore, what are we making visible if they're actually really visible? So I actually really like the metaphor of disruption in, in the sense that infrastructures are disruptive, but also we're trying to disrupt the canon of urban theory that we've tried to, you know, that we've accepted over 50 years from the from the birth of the of the sort of the field. And so, so disruption to me is a useful intellectual and material like material way to think about infrastructure. To get at your question, I, I actually think it's a very valid question. Um, uh, and, 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 and so I have a forthcoming paper. Um, I think this really gets at the, at the, the post-colonial urbanism that, that Rosie was laying out earlier. How do we actually dis, uh, disrupt these boundaries between the global north and south and bring ideas of infrastructure, the politics of infrastructure, uh, you know, and the assemblages that constitute infrastructure um, to bear on the global north where we seem, seem to have sort of forgotten that infrastructure has so much power. So I have a forthcoming paper um, comparing um, water marginalization um, in the global north and global south, looking at the case of the Central Valley in California, where people live in global south-like conditions, right? Um, and, and so here you're really disrupting the idea that people in the global north have water access, right? In fact, there are many places that don't, and so how do we actually use ideas of urban informality developed very richly in the global south to understanding these third world conflicts in the global north? That is a disruptive intellectual practice. That is a subversive intellectual practice. That is the kind of work that I really like to do and I'm, I'm starting to do right now. And I think that gets really nicely to your question in New York City, you know? New York City has a lot of places that don't conform to this global infrastructural ideal, or the, the, you know, the, the modern infrastructural ideal. Um, and I think the fact that New York City, you know, suffered so badly in the aftermath of, of, of Superstorm Sandy means that it is not immune to disruption, right? And, and that is, again, the kind of post-colonial theory, traveling theory, I think, that makes it, that it, it makes it such a rich case. Um, and so to, I think you actually put it very nicely. Should politicians pay attention to the interstitial spaces, you know, the spaces in between, the spaces that don't conform to how we think about infrastructure? And I absolutely think so. And I think the more that we're facing this kind of world in which you know, environmental change is affecting infrastructure, the more we'll start to break down the barriers between the North and the South. Climate change is going to do that, you know. Um, and finally, a question about the agency of, of infrastructure um, and resisting enrollment. I mean, absolutely, that was, that was what I was trying to get at with uh, the political stakes are that actually it floods. You know, infrastructure is not easily amenable to being used, um, in my case, the stormwater infrastructure, to being used as, as just pure sanitation lines because when you start doing that, you're actually... Um, worsening the flood risk of the city and so you know one day one fine day it ex literally explodes right there's they're layered with, with sewage infrastructure and when it rains it just kind of the whole thing just comes up so there's this it's very again visceral you can actually see the agency in action i mean and it's like pushed to a sort of limit and then and then and then it floods and similarly when you're commodifying wetlands 
you know, you're asking for trouble because infrastructure is not, that kind of infrastructure, wetland infrastructure, is not very easily enrolled and subdued by capital because it has a sort of potency that comes out. And of course, just to kind of qualify the idea of non-human agency, there is no non-human agency without, in some senses, a human agency that, that it's kind of very mutually enro enrolled and implicated. And so I think the, the, the critical and sophisticated theorizing around that really takes, thinks about both of these things in conjunction um, and not kind of simplif simplified, like environmentally deterministic, like, oh, it rains and we flood. You know, it's more like we ra it rains. And that interacts with all these systems that we set in place that then has this kind of energy of its own, right? I think that kind of theorizing is really exciting, it's really material, and it's historic as well. Um, concept metaphors, I mean, we all need them, or we all use them, and we all um, uh, get constrained by them as well, right? So they're kind of, they open up possibilities, but they also, you know, they're treacherous, and that they constrain us into a certain way of thought. I'm not particularly wedded um, to this idea of visibility. I think it leaves out so much of the ways that uh, our built environments, and that's the term that I prefer to use, um, um, uh, shape or make certain kinds of tastes or possibilities possible or impossible, right? So, I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, the easy way out of it would just to say, you know, the question is not so much what's visible or 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 invisible, but rather on what terms does it emerge as as an object of collective attention, right? Um, of collective visibility, if you will. Right. So that is like so. Yeah. I mean, there are many things we don't notice in, in our cities where things are functioning properly. In, in many places where I've worked, I guess in the global north, things don't work properly at all, and, and they're quite noticeable. So so this divide is really confusing to me. Um, but I mean, again, my, my push is always to think about in what terms are, is it possible for something <coughs> like you know your pipe or your you know burn from a pipe or or an elevator to become um, a site of intense organizing and litigation, right? So those are more interesting to me than rather not like we've ignored these and let's make them visible. It's rather to ask in what terms in, in these life worlds do these objects become visible or interesting. So in that respect, organizing around a highway or a protest against racism that centers on a highway is really interesting, right? In what terms? Um, New York, um, um, more attentive to people. Uh, how do we? Have, so, I, so I think I think I have sketchy notes on this, but um, how can we build better infrastructures in New York? Was that the question? Um, I don't, unfortunately, do any practical work, so so I, I can't really answer that question. But I have a lot of suggestions, right? So somehow, sometimes. Um, where I've worked in public housing in Chicago, there are some very straightforward things that are design issues that could have easily been uh, assessed if, if someone had taken the time to ask these very mundane questions. Where do people hang up clothes? Um, how thick are the walls that contain noise? Right? Do, are there any sort of front spaces versus back spaces? These sound like very mundane things, but these are the very issues that in the, trans, in the transformation from high rise to sort of more scattered site public housing, people are losing their leases over, right? Because they prefer to be out front um, because um, noise travels differently through drywall than it did through concrete, right? Because heat, um, concrete retains heat in a way that drywall won't, right? So these are very small, minor things that could have a, a very smart urban designer could have you know, found their way around um, without, and you know, the result of not asking these questions means that some of my interlocutors have burned down their houses on accident or lost their leases. So, so they're really important but small, mundane things um, that end up being sort of quality of life pivots that then evict families from public housing. So yeah, absolutely. I, I would love um, for that to be a kind of. Uh, I, I do have ideas about this. It should be a sort of you know part of the curriculum of urban planners, right? To sort of take a course that asks them to think about how to talk to a range of people and listen for a range of desires and and then and, and stuff like that. So, um, so apparently I have ideas about that. Um, the fact, the political stakes, methodologically, um, infrastructure is resisting enrollment. Um, I mean, I don't really like thinking about. This idea of like matter that resists human action, right? I, I sort of think um, so. We have sort of human action or intention or design, and then we have matter that can then push back in unexpected ways or unintended consequences. I I want to think more about the co-constitution of the world of humans and what are not humans. Um, I, I was resisting a little bit the black boxing of capitalism and neoliberalism. Yeah, but absolutely. Yeah. Um, not so much the non-human. Non-human. Okay. So the political stakes. Yeah. Um, the political stakes are, are huge, right, to asking these questions. Um, um, I mean, in, in Detroit, it's the question about whether or not people are going to be 
I mean, if, if you do believe this connection between neurological you know, decay and, and injection of, of lead, it's whether or not you, know, you have people that can have sound lives. I mean, so there are, there are really, I think, interesting stakes to asking questions um, that take, that poke at this nature-culture divide, right? And d just don't reiterate it, but really take it apart and think about the distribution of well-being. Why is it that so many of my interlocutors in Chicago are dying 30 years before um, other people are, right? These are uh, of diseases that I don't quite understand, right? And that they don't quite understand. So th there are really important things that we get at when we talk about infrastructure, the built environment. We open up questions about precisely certain kinds of toxicities, certain kinds of questions about obesity that, that I think need to be on the table and not left to, to the scientists who think about genetic rootedness, right? So that's, that would be my push here, to really piece apart this nature-culture divide, not to reinscribe a, nation, a, a notion of racial difference, but to really think about how um, capitalism distributes well-being on very uneven terms, right? Such that some people will die 20, 30 years earlier than other folks in, in our city, in this city, right? So, so those, I think, are the stakes, and I think they're huge and worth attending to. Great, great way to end. Thank you all very much, and thanks all for coming out tonight. Thank mm -hmm. you.